Cool. Well, welcome back. Uh, so you're all here as students at school on a Saturday listening to a teacher talk about teaching. Uh, so really, as teachers, it's kind of our job to think about this future, this technological future. Our future is you, our students. Uh, well, our job, the logistics of that constantly change. What doesn't change is our motivation. Our motivation is making incremental changes in the lives of our students to cause ripples through time. For all of us, when we think about technological innovation and advancement, we have certain examples that come to mind. For me, my last name is Cassette, but if you see it spelled, it's spelled like a French Canadian would do it with an O. So a lot of people will pronounce that as Cosette or Cosetti. Uh, I've always used the same example every year to help people know how to pronounce my name. One of these. Now, as I continue teaching, my audience keeps changing, and it's getting to the point where nobody knows what one of these is anymore. Um, technology advances. Uh, this is just one part of the technological journey when we talk about how we listen to music. Before this, uh, we had records, uh, vinyl records. Before that, there was 8-track. Uh, after this, CDs. I still have a large collection of CDs in my car. But I rarely listen to CDs anymore because most of my music is streamed online or MP3s that I already have downloaded to my computer. Unless you're a real audiophile, you go all the way back. Vinyl's the only one for you. But as we see, technology changes. We see this advancement and a change in the things that we're using. In the classroom, this happens all the time. Um, and there's a lot of different examples. To name one, this is what a lot of your classrooms look like. Up at the front of the classroom is a smart board where you can write right on it. It displays the slides. You can interact all the time with that content. Uh, that is not the first iteration of that. Um, before there were smart boards in front of the classroom, there were just projection screens like this one. But they could still project whatever was on the computer. You could change that at will. Before that, you could still display things, uh, but they were on a transparency. They would shine a light through and it would come through. You could write on it. And that was really innovative in its day. That for the first time, you didn't have to pre-write everything. It was, it was there, ready to go, and you could kind of change at will. Um, and obviously before that, chalkboards uh, that we still have today, uh, but it's not the primary focal point in our classroom. A lot of the teachers that I teach with and my colleagues have seen a lot of these changes firsthand. Um, that they've lived through the change all the way to smart boards or the way that assignments are assigned or submitted or graded or how copies are made. Um, I actually haven't lived through a lot of these changes. Uh, as a teacher, if I were to go back to the district website and pull a photo that's on the home page on the day I started teaching, it looked like this. Teaching as I have always known it has had technology. Uh, you could say that as a teacher, I am a technology native, much like a lot of my students grew up and have grown up using smartphones and computers all of their lives. Uh, for me, I have only known teaching with smart boards and iPads and one-to-one -one technology. But as a student, I definitely grew up seeing all these changes firsthand. Um, and there are a lot of examples of that, and a lot of them deal with a lot of like minutia of the things that we don't often think about. So for you, Google Docs is a large part of your lives, and the idea that you can collaborate on a document at the same time is just kind of something that you do. Uh, for me, a lot of my time in college was spent in this building right here. Uh, this is the Black Engineering Building, and that computer lab is where I spent most of my life uh, during my time in college. And there were a lot of projects that I did, one in particular uh, that I spent working on in there. This project that I'm thinking about was a group project, and we were getting pretty close to our deadline. And when I say that, I'm not talking about due date, I'm talking about due time. Uh, this thing was due at 5 p.m., and it was about 4.30. And now, I know none of you in this audience have experienced uh, getting that close to a due time before, so <laughs> imagine with me that you're getting close like that. Um, now, for us, we had these different parts of this project all ready to go, we were done but we needed to put them all into one file and submit that before the submission window closed. Um, we didn't have a cloud storage to do that, but we did have one of these. Uh, we had a flash drive that our cloud storage was us saving this file to the flash drive and then physically throwing it across the computer lab to the next person who would catch it, put it in, store theirs, 
throw it across, catch, put it in, until we had all of our pieces assembled and submitted 30 seconds before that due time. It was a pretty exciting moment. Not one I want to relive. Um, if I go back a little bit farther in my technological history, uh, when I was in elementary school, it was around the time that people first started having internet in their homes. Um, and it was pretty common now that as we left the school building, we didn't really call each other on the phone, uh, but now people were going home and they were logging on to a chat room uh, and they were com communicating. They were having these conversations through instant messenger. Uh, well, almost everyone was doing that. My family, we, we were lucky enough to have access to the internet, but our internet access was confined a little bit. Our subscription allowed us to log on for three hours a month. Um, so three hours a month, for those of you in this audience, is a fairly uh, restrictive amount of internet uh, when you have a family of four uh, and all the nights that you're trying to get on and makes it a little harder when this happens every single time. So by about that time, it was time to log off and the next person could get on. Um, so for us, uh, now, living today, when a lot of us spend three hours or more every single night logged onto the internet, what does that mean for us? Where does that leave us today? I want to highlight two major impacts that I've seen from my perspective. It has to do with our brains, or how we consume information, and our hearts, or rather our emotions. How this technology and our interaction with it has changed the way that we feel. For us, when we talk about knowledge and what knowledge means, it's impossible to really discount how important the internet and essentially the endless amount of information that we have access to really is. Uh, not only does it change the way that we go through our lives, but it changes our conversation in the educational space as well. Specifically around the question of what does it mean to know something today? In a classroom, does it really matter if you have something memorized, if you can just click and then get that information? And what is our role as teachers then when virtually any question that we could ask is going to be Googleable? Um, the other day, we had uh, an issue in our house where our washing machine started making this terrible, terrible sound. Like I would go down and it was physically rocking every single time I went down. Now, I don't really know anything about washing machines. Uh, to be honest, I'm a little confused at what settings will give me the best load of laundry in general. But in this particular time, I was pretty confident that I could fix this thing. And of course, not knowing anything about washing machines, the first thing that I do is I go on Google and I just Google, how do you fix a washing machine? This was the first link that came up. So my new mustached friend walked me through all of the steps in three minutes of how to totally disassemble this washing machine. In about half an hour, I had that entire thing in parts on the floor. Uh, fast forward a little bit, turns out nothing was actually wrong with that washing machine. Uh, I had disassembled it for no reason, but thanks to Google, I put it all back together and it works again. Now, I think that we go through a lot of our lives fixing washing machines and kind of learning about things as we go. And with the resources that are out there, the way that we interact with this knowledge has changed and it is constantly changing. Our conversation about the value of knowing and the role of education in this new technological landscape is far from over. The second primary way that we see our technological lives changing is a little bit less obvious. You see, this has a lot of power on our emotions. We all have a desire to feel validated and the like has this ability to quantify and tally up how people respond to us. It's nearly impossible to completely disconnect ourselves from this emotional desire to seek likes or maintain a snap streak or whatever it is you do on the app TikTok. I still haven't quite figured that out. Um, but it's impossible for us to fully connect because there is a power over us that our technology has. In education, this results in a battle for attention. Uh, when so much of this value is placed in these short-term sorts of validation, it gets harder and harder to focus our attention on something larger. And that something larger often includes school. 
I think that one of the ways as teachers that we get to enter this battle is to infuse our classrooms with some sort of shareable experience. Now, as a science teacher, I'm lucky I get to do this all the time. Uh, a lot of my class involves blowing things up in fire. Uh, and I typically have no problem having people take video of that. How many of you in this classroom are uh, what I would call fireworks photographers? People that, watching a fireworks show, pull out your camera and you're like, I need to take a picture of every single one of these, right? So, you people drive me nuts. <laughs> there is a certain aspect of just being in the moment and just enjoying it then. Like, who is gonna look through a photo album full of fireworks someday? But I also think that there is something to validating experience by capturing and sharing it. Uh, this is a picture that happened in my classroom, uh, <laughs> taken by a student. Uh, and that is the face you make, by the way, when you realize you're doing something dangerous a little too close to students. It's also really fun to involve students in this process of sharing something over the larger community as well. Uh, a few years ago, my students convinced me that it'd be a good idea to jump into the mannequin challenge. We made one of our own. Some of you are in this classroom right now. So, also another example of fire happening in the classroom. So we shared this video to a larger community, we posted it online, um, and people found it shareable. They found it deemed worthy to share, and my, student was, my students were front and center in that process. Uh, it turns out that the Science Magazine uh, website actually featured this in their official article about the mannequin challenge. I have no idea how they even found it, uh, but it was there. Uh, we also, every year, take a class selfie at the beginning of the year. My goal is that someday this is just a high-speed video of me aging uh, as my <laughs> students flash around me. As a teacher, our community is our classroom, but it's also our colleagues. Uh, and I think it's important to highlight that as well. Uh, a couple years ago, all of the science colleagues and I recorded a rap Some of you have seen this. It's the biggest event of the entire semester. We thought that if we wrap, you crush your final test. Or at least give you a chance to have a worth of distraction because the teachers love their chemical reaction. <laughs> All right, so that goes on for a while. It actually ends with your principal rapping. Um, and here, in education, we see this battle for attention. But my question is, and what I'm constantly thinking about, are do these injections of social media, this experience of emotion, affect the way that we teach? Personally, I think that the best teaching that I do happens between these moments. But I think that these moments are important to refocus our emotions on the things that are in real life, not just virtual, um, not just in that space. So where do we go from here? What does a technological future for education hold? I think it all really comes down to the two core concepts of connectedness and the unbelievable access that the internet provides. This can also result in a sort of a la carte information age um, that can have a negative side to it as well, where you can pretty much pick and choose the information that fits your worldview and then focuses on the things that you already believe. This can take the form of communities that gather around topics like the Flat Earth Society, that it spread disinformation that, while untrue, isn't exactly harming anyone. But there are also examples where this can take a negative turn. Um, if you think about the work that's gone into the anti-vax movement and against vaccines, this has led to deaths, and it's led to bringing back diseases that we once thought were entirely eradicated. So it is not without cost. Now for the good news. Learning's everywhere. Um, you can find it in all the different corners of the internet. As Gabby was talking about earlier, you can learn any skill that you want just with the right Google search. There are pockets of YouTube that are devoted entirely for learning. Uh, I'm biased towards science, so here's a lot of my favorite science YouTube channels. And a lot of these things are so engaging and so interesting that they are shared not just by teachers like myself, but by your friends and your family. Learning is everywhere. It also leads to a rapid spread of information that can result in conversations that are current and pervasive lead to arguments in search of the truth. You might remember this, uh, totally gold and white, by the way. Or this. Yeah. 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 
Now, those conversations aren't super academic, but this idea of having a conversation and trying to get to the truth can lead us towards great things. The spread of information has also allowed us to stay informed about the amazing things that are happening all around us. Last year, you might remember this, the very first black hole photo ever taken. Uh, this was a really exciting time in the science community, and it spilled out over that science community into pop culture. Um, that many of you have seen this, even if your Twitter feed doesn't look like mine, which is just all scientists. Uh, last year also, we were able to rejoice with other scientists um, when the InSight lander landed on Mars. Now, our rejoicing maybe didn't involve quite as much fist pumping, uh, but it's exciting. Uh, the internet has allowed us to flatten this space, not in the way that a flat earther would have you believe, but in a way that allows us to have access to some of these experts in the field. It's also changed the way that we as teachers can collaborate. Um, I get to communicate with people around the country and around the world through the wonders of Twitter. So with all of this constant change, I want to find, uh, finish by reflecting about what my role is as a teacher. Uh, what can be done now that you can pretty much learn anything without a classroom. I like to think of us more as curators. So whereas teachers used to be kind of the source of knowledge, now the knowledge is there, the information is there. We are a guide to help you make sense of that. Uh, it's easy to consume information, but teachers exist to help you understand and to ultimately create something with that information. So I want to final uh, end with this. So this is where my thought is now. My daughter, Callie, who's actually in the back, is about one week away from being 17 months old. And it is possible that some of you in this audience will be her teacher one day, helping her to navigate a technological future that we can't even imagine right now. She might not have to limit her internet usage to three hours per month, or by the time she's grown up, I bet nobody will un understand what a cassette tape is anymore. But she will grow up, like I did, in a world that is constantly changing. My hope is that whatever that world looks like, she will have a steady curator designing a story that taps into the endless information around her while capturing the excitement and the emotion of learning. Thanks.